So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Select Bio webinar series. We're delighted to welcome Scientific Bioprocessing today as the sponsor of this webinar and the speakers. Scientific Bioprocessing, or SBI for short, develops sensors and systems for cell culture and bioprocessing. SBI's products are designed for regenerative medicine, biotech, and pharma applications. And uh, specifically, SBI develops optical sensors for culture, cell culture monitoring and control through the closed loop feedback. SBI systems add agitation and environmental control that can be used to modulate culture conditions. And the company, SBI, is headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Today, we're delighted to welcome Jake Boy, who is the application scientist, to give a talk entitled Real-Time Sensing of pH and Dissolved Oxygen in Microfluidics Devices. Also, we're very pleased that Dr. Sandy Williams, Biomedical Engineering Consultant for SBI, will be present for the Q&A section. So at this point, we're going to have uh, Jake do the presentation. Upon the conclusion of the presentation, we'll be happy to take questions. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Jake, who will start the presentation. So Jake, the podium is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. So the presentation today is going to be about optical sensors, um, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, but after this presentation, hopefully you know plenty about them. And I'll also be touching on some different applications for these types of sensors, what they are really specialized for, and how we can incorporate them in different cell culture devices. Okay, so just a little bit about our company. Scientific Bioprocessing, or SBI for short, is a relatively new company, but we are a subsidiary from our parent company, Scientific Industries. And Scientific Industries has been around for a long time, since the 1950s, and they have they invented a, a device that I'm sure many of you are familiar with called the Vortex Genie. Um, so those are pretty ubiquitous among a lot of labs. And uh, so our technology um, has been developed by our collaborators at UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, with the cast members down there. And we have patents on optical sensors for monitoring dissolved oxygen and pH. And we're also working on things like glucose and CO2. We are mainly a sensor company, and we think that there are four really important things to touch on when it comes to your sensors that you use for your process. First, the sensors need to be reliable. Um, Real-time monitoring is important, and we should be able to work with the smallest vessels, the largest vessels, all the way across the board with the same sensors, um, the same reliable monitoring system. The feedback should be automatic with control so that you're minimally invasive throughout your process, the sensors should allow you to maintain relevant physiological parameters where the cells are growing in your culture vessel. And the sensors should be economically remarkable, or in other words, inexpensive. So optical sensors, this, this is a term that some people are familiar with, others are not. So I'm going to introduce them and talk a little bit about what they are for, what they look like, and some of the advantages of them. Right now, the most commonly used sensors are bulky electrochemical probes, either in bioreactors or other devices, but these are not suitable for things that are like microfluidic devices or T-flasks where you have such low fill volumes and, and such little space to work with that these, these types of sensors, the electrochemical probes, are just impossible to use. So the result of this is that there is a gap in our knowledge during cell culture. We don't really know some of the key parameters like dissolved oxygen and pH when we're growing cells in these small devices. And this is really a problem because right now the industry is moving so much in the direction of standardization throughout your process. We recognize the need for the improvement here and a way to do real-time monitoring in the smallest devices all the way up through you know, industrial scale. Like I mentioned, Typical electrochemical probes like the Clark electrode, these types of things are just too big and bulky to use in these types of devices, not to mention the task and the burden of having to clean these things each time you want to do a run. So introducing our most basic product offering, which kind of sets you up with, call it the developer's kit, and because it's meant for you to develop along the way of using optical sensors to get familiar with them and then also to realize some of the benefits of using these types of sensors. 
So on the left, you can see a quick summary of what this product is about. There is software that helps you to, or that displays the readings that the sensors are getting. Um, and then you can see the readers that are placed under various cell culture devices. We have a multi-well plate, a 250 milliliter shake flask, um, a small evaporation dish, dish, and a T75 T flask. And if you see in the T75 um, image there, you can see that there are optical sensors placed inside of that. Um, so these are just some examples of some of the cell culture vessels where previously this type of sensing was not possible, but with optical sensors, you can gain data in these types of vessels. Just a little bit of background on optical sensors and some of the specifications and their capabilities. So the pH sensors have a range mammalian physiological from six to eight, dissolved oxygen zero to 100%. These sensors are extremely accurate and when they're reading, um, once you have them reading and once they're running, they really do not waver back and forth uh, with the reading. So the accuracy and the precision is really great with these. They have quick response time. They can operate anywhere from five degrees Celsius all the way up to 50 degrees. You know, typically 37 degrees is where people are running their experiments. Um, the sensors come pre-calibrated. Uh, recalibration is possible with the software in just one simple click. Um, these can be sterilized via steam or gamma irradiation. Um, and one of the best things about these, which of course is a really important point for a lot of the audience members today, is the size and the dimensions of these sensors and how flexible that is. So typically we would produce these sensors in one centimeter squares and you know 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters and the height of them is 0.3 millimeters. So imagine a couple of pieces of paper stacked on top of each other for the profile of them. Now that's our that's our standard size. We can also go down to four millimeter spots and these spots can be mounted using fiber optics and read that way. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. Many of you listening today use microfluidic devices in your research. And this is a new application area for our technology. And we're working to integrate our optical sensors into the world of microfluidics because we think there's a great opportunity for both us and for researchers using these types of devices. So we've recently launched a new collaboration with the University of Delaware and Wake Forest University, and we're in the process of integrating our sensors into their devices now. So organ on a chip, um, this is a really, really cool technology. It's been around for about 10 years. Um, there have been some TED Talks on it. That's when you really know it's relevant. Um, and these devices have emerged as a promising alternative to animal models and also um, a more representative model of the human physiology. One of the great things about organ on a chip is that it's, it offers great opportunity for personalized medicine. It's inexpensive. It can be reproduced pretty reliably. It's great for drug screening models. It's pretty quick, very high throughput. That's one of the great advantages of it. And it's, you know, you're not using animal models, which can become very costly, particularly if you're, uh, if you're in a lab or working with a lab that does something like, like mouse mills, where you have to keep the mice alive and then you have to process all of those animals and all the way that you have to dispose of them. It's just really expensive and very time consuming. I mean, labs use entire divisions um, dedicated just to this process. So organ on a chip is a great alternative for this. And it's a way that we feel the biotech world is moving and also different types of medicine and pharmacological studies. Some studies that we'd like to highlight, two, two really cool studies, um, and using Emulate's organ on a chip devices, one showed that a liver on a chip was able to better predict human cell toxicity compared to rat in vivo models. So again, talking about how these chips can be used to better model what's actually happening inside of a human with human cells as opposed to an animal model, which can only get you so far in certain cases. Another study is uh, with duodenum intestine, intestine chip, which showed that the RNA expression with that device uh, more closely mimicked human adult duodenal tissue compared to a duodenal organoid. So here are just some examples, and I'm sure there are more, of how organ on a chip devices outperform animal models um, in these certain areas. So we want to integrate our sensors with these small microfluidic devices, and we have identified three main ways that this could be done. One, um, in the actual channels where the media is flowing through. Now, this is, of course, dependent upon the geometry. A lot of these organ on a chip models are different, um, different sizes and different ways that the plastic is etched or printed that allows for different sizes. So 
Uh, if geometry allows, this would be the most straightforward way to apply optical sensors. Another way um, is in the perfusion loop or in the feeding tubes that go through from the reservoir to the chip, and then also the tubes that come from the chip to the waste reservoir. So the idea here is that we would incorporate a flow cell in the perfusion loop in the actual tube itself and do sensing as the media is flowing from the reservoir to the chip and then also as the media the waste is flowing from the chip to the waste reservoir something like this would give you an idea of the profile of how dissolved oxygen and how ph are changing as they go through the chip what the cells are doing to the ph and the dissolved oxygen as that media flows through and then of course another option is to have the sensors in the media reservoir themselves so that media that you're going to be eventually flowing through that chip, you would have an idea or you would know exactly what that dissolved oxygen and pH is in that reservoir before it makes its way to the chip. You could also have sensors in the waste reservoir so you can have a, an idea again of what the cells are doing to the dissolved oxygen and pH as it flows through the system. So here is an example of one of our collaborators and on the right you can see a photograph of their design and their setup. Um, with a liver and a cardiac chip so what's really cool to see here is the actual setup so you can envision where these sensors could fit into this process so they're planning to use the sensors in the reservoir and you can see the reservoir there it's the little vial with the, the pink media and the orange cap so you can imagine these optical sensors could be placed inside of that vial where you would have sensing with dissolved oxygen and ph before that media flows down through the chip you also see the tubes that are running from that reservoir to the chip and then the tube that carries the waste away from the chip. So you can just imagine a small flow cell, you know, shaped like a T with a fiber optic cable running to it that allows you to do sensing on those, on that media um, as it moves through the various stages of the chip. Now I'm going to move on and talk a little, a little bit about uh, some studies that have been done in cell culture devices that everyone is familiar with, the tissue culture flask or the T flask. These studies are going to highlight some of the opportunities that optical sensors have provided for studies in culture devices like this that were not possible before. And I think the idea here is to imagine how microfluidics could be next on this list of devices where we can crack that black box open and find out what's happening in our micro, microfluidic devices in ways that we never could before using optical sensing. So this first study, is a scale down study talking about T flasks. And it's going to use several geometries, a T25, T75, a T150. And it's going to compare these, this T flask to several other small cell culture devices. One of the main takeaways here is to notice that this type of study, which is really just testing the efficacy of these different cell culture devices, could not have been possible before with bulky electrochemical probes and would not have been accurate with offline sampling where you know, you take a sample of your low fill volume to begin with, and then by the time you get that sample to where you're doing your sensing, the dissolved oxygen levels have changed by that point. So these optical sensors allow for sensing directly in these vessels. It's minimally invasive, and the sensors are placed right where the cells are growing. So we have a really, really good idea of what those cells are actually experiencing in these types of vessels. Another really great takeaway from the study is that these researchers ultimately found that the rocking, a rocking T flask, so we'll get into the rocking motion here in a bit, but a rocking T flask, a T75, can match the KLA, which is the mass transfer coefficient, basically referring to the ability of that culture vessel to transfer the gas layer, so the environment that the cells are growing in, down to the cells through the media. These T flasks can match the KLA of a 10 liter wave bioreactor. And this is something really astounding that was, that was shown as far as scalability using these sensors. The dissolved oxygen sensor was used in this case to estimate the KLA in the T flask and to match it to a cultivag wave bioreactor. And then optical pH sensors were also in the flask to monitor pH and to see what the researchers could find about pH during this study. So the reason that T flasks were chosen and the reason that T flasks have, you know, were designed in the first place is because they have a really great surface area to volume ratio. You know, the geometry of the flask allows for a pretty low level of fill volume as opposed to the surface area that's being exposed to the gas layer. And the idea behind this design is that the gas layer in an incubator would be able to transfer using this 
high surface area to volume ratio would be able to transfer through that liquid down to where the cells are growing. And it was thought that this is sufficient, that a T-flash geometry would be good enough to do this. But using optical sensors, these researchers found that this is actually not the case. What happens is this media acts as an insulator that does not allow that gas layer. So that environment where these these T-flasks are growing, you know, like in a, in a CO2 incubator, you have 18.5% oxygen, 5% CO2. And you think that that gas layer is reaching the cells as they're growing, but this is actually incorrect. The media acts as an insulating layer. And as the cells respire and propagate down on the bottom of this flask, they're consuming oxygen, producing CO2. That CO2 is heavy and it lays on top of the cells. So not only are you decreasing your pH and making the cell, uh, the cell environment more acidic, the cells are now becoming hypoxic and eventually anoxic as they respire because that media does not allow the gas to travel through it quickly enough to match the metabolism of the cells. So this is a very busy slide, uh, but the point of this slide is just to show that a T flask, and in this case it's a T25, was performing the best amongst all these different types of culture vessels in terms of KLA. So we see here mentioned a spinner flask, super spinners, uh, culti flasks, and then at the top left, we see a T flask. And the way this graph is set up is just meant to show you that the T flask had the better KLA among all these cell culture devices. And again, the scientists were able to figure this out using these optical sensors in all of these flask types. Basically, what, they, what the conclusion they came to is that T flasks, particularly rocking T flasks, have the best oxygen, oxygen transfer capabilities versus other PSDs, process scouting devices, which are other small cell culture devices, and a better KLA compared to those devices. The FDA is really working towards standardization right now, and there's a lot of talk in all of these conferences, uh, you know, pre-COVID times when we were allowed to meet up together, we would talk about things that the FDA was pushing, such as standardization from the beginning of your process all throughout to the end. This includes using the exact type of sensing that you would use in your scale down uh, that you ultimately use in your scale up process. Optical sensors are the only sensor type out there that allows you to do sensing in a small scale down device as well as scale up. So they function well in both environments. Moving on to another study building upon that last study that we just talked about, which proved that T flasks were the ideal flask at this small scale for doing this type of sensing, for doing this type of cell culture. I mean, here we have a study, uh, we have a graph here, figure four and figure five, and one is labeled partially open, one is labeled closed. These are both referring to T flasks that are growing cells inside of a cell culture incubator. So a CO2 incubator, 18.5% oxygen, 5% CO2. These are both T225 flasks, and they both have a four millimeter liquid depth. And this is these are affixed with optical sensors for dissolved oxygen, and these are showing what happens to the dissolved oxygen concentration in these flasks, in these incubators, as they sit there statically with cells growing. So you can see that the closed T flask here in figure five, after, you know, after only a couple of days, so we're looking here at, you know, between two and three days, that cell culture in that T flask has become completely hypoxic. There is no oxygen left after after 70 hours of growth in that flask. And you can see that the graph shows that that oxygen concentration is declining steadily over the course of the first couple of days of culturing. And scientists would have no way of knowing this without optical sensors that were showing them this in their T flasks. And I'm sure this may come as a shock to many people listening today, that your flasks, your T flasks that are growing statically in your CO2 incubator are becoming hypoxic after only a couple of hours of growing. And the same thing, so, you know, I used to work in a cell culture lab where we would partially open the lids of our T flasks because we were told that that would allow the, the oxygen and the gas to mix with that liquid and allow the cells to breathe better. But this study here is showing that partially opening that flask actually decreases performance in this case, but the performance is no better than a closed lid on your T flask. And you can see that the oxygen level, while it's a little more sporadic, is also declining rapidly and actually reaches anoxia after only a couple of days. During growth, really, what we, what we talked about a little bit before, and just to highlight this again, is that as the cells are metabolizing, as they're respiring, they're eating up oxygen, 
they're producing CO2, and the transfer of the gas to provide more oxygen to the cells through that liquid media layer is far too slow to keep up with the metabolism of the cells, especially as they're proliferating. So the takeaway here is that even the T-flask, the flask that was shown in the prior study to be the best cell culture device at this small scale is overwhelmingly liquid phase mass tra transfer limited. The gas cannot get through that liquid down to the cells at the rate that the cells need the oxygen. As a solution, the authors of this study propose gentle agitation, and this is where the rocking comes in. Here we see on the right a setup of the study, and the idea here is that if this, if this liquid layer is acting as an insulator between the gas and the cells, when the T-flask is growing just sitting there in, in the incubator, what if we are able to agitate that media just a little bit, you know, so we're not putting sheer stress on the cells, we're not lifting these adherent cells, but we're just creating this gentle wave motion that allows that media to be disrupted that could maybe allow the gas to mix a little better uh, and get down to the cells. And this would also help to disrupt the CO2 layer that's building up on top of the cells and to mix the pH, dilute that lower pH throughout the, the entire media so that we don't get pockets of acidic layers and things like that where our cells are growing. So on the right, in figure B here, we see the optical sensors are fixed. This is a T75. So you can see how small these sensors are and how low profile they are sitting inside of this flask. And then in the very center, we see this flask sitting in the incubator on a rocking platform, and it rocks gently back and forth in this incubator. And the results here are pretty stunning. There are several graphs here. We're going to move on to graphs C and D here in the next slide, but I just want to point out that some important takeaways right off the bat. The flasks yielded higher viable cell density, 25% less lactate when they're rocking. The cell cultures grew much more quickly and much more densely. And really what this can be attributed to is just allowing the cells to have a consistent culture environment. So the oxygen is not jumping all over the place. The pH isn't dropping. The cells are experiencing more physiological conditions for a longer period of time, which leads to healthier and happier cells ultimately, and more productive cells as we'll see. So here's figure D blown up. This is showing the pH in that T flask. The black line here is comparing a static T flask in the exact same experimental setup. And the red line is showing the T flask that was doing the gentle agitation, the gentle rocking. And you can see they're both T75s. And what we're looking at here is the pH was able to maintain its was able to maintain itself much longer and much better in that rocking T flask, where it's remaining more physiologically relevant for longer, whereas the static T flask was dipping way down to dangerous levels for those cells as the cells are growing. And this again occurs in only a course of a few hours. Another really important thing to note is that these cells had a 31% higher antibody titer when they were in these rocking flasks as opposed to static flasks. Again, maintaining these physiological and consistent conditions allows these cells to be happier and healthier as they grow. So here's figure C. This is showing the dissolved oxygen. Again, the red line is the rocking flask. The black line is the static flask. And what we're seeing here, again, is really astounding, um, which, which also you know, reiterates the data that was found by the prior study. After only two to three days, that static T flask in this T75 became completely anoxic. The rocking flask, by comparison, maintained a very consistent level of dissolved oxygen as those cells were growing. So it never dipped below 70% in this case. And it just really goes to show that agitating that media allowed that gas to get down to the cells to maintain a healthier and more physiologically relevant environment. And it's all about consistency. The cells do not want to be messed with. They want to grow without being touched. They want to grow without anyone opening that incubator to have to check on them. And what these optical sensors provide is a way of real-time monitoring that you can see on your computer screen so that you don't have to open that incubator to check on your cells. You know what the oxygen is doing in there and you don't need to pass it to the cells quite as often because you know that these cells are maintaining appropriate levels of oxygen and appropriate levels of pH as they're growing. There are a lot of studies being done right now, and, and there was actually recently um, a Nobel Prize given in the field of dissolved oxygen research and the effects that dissolved oxygen has on cells as they're growing. So having too much oxygen 
can be a problem, and being hypoxic with not enough oxygen is also a problem. Cells have normoxic conditions, and normoxic is just referring to the physiologically relevant oxygen parameter that these cells would experience as they're growing in the body. So we try to recreate those conditions as well as possible when we're doing cell culture for the most accurate, reproducible results. Normoxic conditions are really important to pay attention to. And if you don't know what your, what your oxygen levels are as your cells are growing in these cell culture devices, in microfluidic devices, then you really are not paying attention to the effects that oxygen can have on your cell culture and, and consequently on the results of your experiment. So if we want experiments to be standardized, reproducible, high throughput and reliable, then we need to have these parameters monitored and maintained throughout the course of the experiment, throughout the course of several screens through this experiment. There is data that shows hypoxia can drive genetic instability. Obviously, DNA is affected by adverse conditions, so free radicals, reactive oxygen species that exist when we have too much oxygen. Um, so maintaining consistent genetic profiles is really difficult when your oxygen levels are not adequate, when they're not consistent. So here we have a scaled, down, a scaled down study, which is showing a rocking T75 flask. So rocking meaning that gentle agitation we mentioned before in the T75 can match a 10 liter cultibag wave bioreactor. So this is just showing that a T75 flask under the right conditions with the right sensing can actually mimic a 10 liter bioreactor. So scaling up from a T75 to a 10 liter bioreactor. And this is what these graphs are showing. So here. We see figure C, and in figure C, we're looking at the cultibag, which is the red, and then the T75 flask, which is the black. And we can see here that both are maintaining levels of oxygen throughout the experiment as the cells are growing. The same with pH, you can see that the, the red uh, is the cultibag again, the black is the rocking T flask. You can see that the pH levels are almost identical in these two very different devices. But because we're able to mimic conditions and monitor these parameters, we can control them. So we're able to be sure that we can scale up from a T-flask to a cultibag. And then here in figure E, we look at the protein titer of, again, the red line is the cultibag and the black line is the T75. And you can see that that T75 actually is very representative of the protein titer from that cultibag. This is pretty shocking stuff. Uh, and again, information that would not have been available prior to a way of getting sensing in these small devices. Now I'll talk a little bit about our, tech, our technology. And the idea in mind here is that we have spent a lot of time talking about some of the issues, uh, some of the gaps in cell culture, some of the black boxes, which, which are these small cell culture devices where we're not getting data on parameters. But now the optical sensors exist are, and are in the market, we can get ideas about what's happening in our small cell culture devices. And now the question becomes, once we have that data, what do we do with it? And what do we do about it? How do we make sure that we're using this new information to better our process? The first bit of technology I'll talk about, which is the most basic and fundamental form of our technology, is the ID reader. So the reader is what, and so optical sensors work based on fluorescence, and it so this reader sends wavelengths of light that then reflect and fluoresce off of the sensor patch. And that sensor returns a signal depending on the pH or the dissolved oxygen. And then it's interpreted as a reading for dissolved oxygen or pH. So this reader, to give you an idea of the size of this thing, it's about 90 millimeters in diameter, 15 millimeters tall, and it has two sensing channels in it. So that's one of our favorite things about this device is that you can sense pH and dissolved oxygen using just one device, or you can do two channels for dissolved oxygen or two channels for pH. And these can be configured by a customer or a user with just one click in the software. So these devices are watertight. They're meant to be sterilized via ethanol wiping and can be used inside or outside of a cell culture incubator. They can be used up to 50 degrees Celsius um, and function just fine in 37 degrees. So the method of sensing with optical sensors, and so we have a little um, figure here on the left that shows, and, and this is really going to highlight why optical sensors are so special. Here we see uh, in yellow, uh, which is meant to represent a cell culture vessel, we see protons floating around, some oxygen molecules, and then we see the sensor being pointed to there, and that is the optical sensor. The way these things work is they have a silicone adhesive 
on the back of them. And once that adhesive is exposed, you stick it to your culture vessel. And before you inoculate, before you put any media in, you, you either, you know, you can sterilize that whole device as one unit with the sensor inside of it before inoculation, or the sensors can come pre-sterilized and you can place them into your sterile device. So the idea is that once this sensor is inside of that device, you never have to open that device again in order to do sensing. You don't have to insert any type of probe. You don't have to take a sample from that device. That sensor is sterile and in that device before anything even begins, and then it all, all operates as one single unit. This is, you know, it's not very time intensive. It's uh, very inexpensive, and you don't have to dedicate a lot of care to the culture because you can just let it grow and do your sensing without having to pay much attention, and you're not risking contamination. Again, what we're seeing here is the light from the reader travels through the wall of the culture vessel, fluoresces off of that sensor patch, and then provides you with a reading of dissolved oxygen or pH. The fiber optics capabilities with the reader, this is something that we really, really like. And this is something that is going to be, I think, you know, very applicable to the microfluidics world where, you know, right now the limiting factor of our reader is that we have to have a certain size for our sensors to capture that beam of light as it travels through. But when we use fiber optics, we can control the size of that light beam, and therefore we can decrease the size of our sensors. So currently, we go down to four millimeter diameter sensor spots, and these fiber optic cables allow us to do that. We can use smaller cables to get smaller geometries, and that's something we're working on for the future. But as of now, these fiber optics allow us to accommodate many, many different form factors. So we can run these fibers to flow through cells. We can use these fibers as a hot swap for a, you know, electrochemical probe that goes through the head space or through the head plate of a bioreactor. Uh, we can run these fibers to the side of a culture vessel, to the bottom of the culture vessel, even to the head space. So one really cool thing about our optical sensors uh, for dissolved oxygen is that they do not need to be wet or immersed in media to work. So you can actually have these sensors operating in the dry air above your media. So you can really test for yourself and see that if you have a sensor sitting in the headspace where the gas layer exists, you can do oxygen sensing there, and then you can place a sensor down where the cells are growing in the media, and you can actually monitor the difference between that gas layer and the gas layer that the cells are actually experiencing as they grow. And you can do this with just one device using the fiber optic system. So here's just another um, diagram of what the fiber optic system looks like. So you can see that basic reader housing, but now it is equipped with fiber optic cables. These fiber optic cables are three millimeters in diameter. They are jacketed. So the jacket adds an extra millimeter. So two millimeter fiber, three millimeter after the jacket. These fibers can be any length. So this, this is just a diagram that sort of cuts them off, but they could be that short if you want them to be. We can also make them you know, a meter long, depending on your application. I spoke a little bit about, you know, once we have the idea about what uh, the sensing parameters are inside of these types of devices, what do we do about it? And we're all about environmental control. Again, maintaining consistent physiological conditions as your cells are growing for healthier, happier, more productive cells. So we spoke a lot about rocking and gentle agitation in T-flasks. And this device, the ID Rocker, does just that. So this device is meant to be placed inside of a cell culture incubator, so it's fully sterilizable. And it has a rocking platform that gently agitates the media of tea flasks. So instead of growing your tea flasks just sitting statically inside of a cell culture incubator, you place them on top of the rocking platform. And the idea here is that the sensors are inside of the tea flask. They're providing real-time data about the dissolved oxygen and pH. The user comes up with a set point. So let's say I don't want my dissolved oxygen to drop below 50%. Then once the cells start to metabolize and that dissolved oxygen begins to drop, the sensing system will tell you that, okay, the dissolved oxygen has dropped below 50, and then the rocker kicks on automatically and gently agitates that media at a speed that, that the user sets and allows that oxygen to rise back up. So once the sensors note that the dissolved oxygen levels have increased above the set point, the rocking stops, um, the platform moves back to a level position, and the cells continue to metabolize and respire just as they want to. So basically what this is, is a closed loop control that allows the cells to call for their own oxygen. So basically these cells are respiring using the system. 
here we have the ID shaker. So this is just like a standard shaker would be, but the difference here is that we have custom holders that allow various geometries of shake flasks to be affixed to the deck where a reader is placed beneath them. So in these in the shake flasks, we have dissolved oxygen sensors, pH sensors, and the, the reader, the ID reader is below that flask and affixed to it as it shakes so that you have uh, real-time data and monitoring of your dissolved oxygen and pH as the shaker table is operating. And here, finally, uh, is what we call the ID data hub. And this is our software that allows for the readouts of all this data and the, rep the graphical representations of it. So this, the software is really great for a few things. Of course, displaying, as you can see there on the left, station one, two, three, and four, this is displaying dissolved oxygen and pH. The user can see the results in real time every 10 seconds if you want to. We also have features here that allow one-step recalibration. And we also have really great graphical representation where you can visually see the changes in your dissolved oxygen and pH as your experiment is running. And then, of course, one of the most important things of all is data logging. So when you're running these experiments, you want to be saving this data. And the software allows you to save the data as your sensors are reading throughout the course of your experiment. So if your experiment is a couple of days, you can save data for a couple of days. If it's a week long, you can save data for a week. If it's a month long, you can also collect data for a whole entire month long experiment using this software. So some of the fields where our sensors are applicable and out in the field. So regenerative medicine and clinical manufacturing. And some of the ways that these sensors are very, very useful. So R&D is a big one. R&D can be very expensive if you're having to use things like you know three liter bioreactors or one liter, bi liter bioreactors where you have to use liters of media each time. And that is expensive as everyone knows, not to mention the cells that you, you, know, that you end up wasting as you are going through this R&D process. What a lot of people do is R&D in things like T flasks, but the issue there, like we've pointed out, is that there is, is without optical sensors, there is not sensing available in T flasks. So you're not controlling some of the most fundamental parameters of your cell culture experiment at that, at that lowest level. So it's really hard to design your experiment whenever you don't know what's happening with your pH and your dissolved oxygen on a small scale, and then you try to scale up and you run into issues at that point. So optical sensors allow for design of experiment with, uh, with a lot more information and a lot more accuracy and consistency and reproducibility from a small scale to a large scale. These are also really, really great for scale down. So let's say you need to do some troubleshooting or you have some type of bottleneck in your process that you need to work out the kinks. And if you're moving down to something as small as a T flask where you don't want to have to use a lot of media, you want a high throughput so that you can figure out the issue quickly, you can equip T flasks with these optical sensors for these scale down to quickly figure out what the issue is, how you can correct it, and how you can get back to scale up and production more quickly and efficient, effectively. So these are also great, again, using the fiber optics, the different form factors, and how we can apply these to the microfluidics world and organ on a chip. The sensors, again, are single use. So once you use them, you throw them out so you don't have to worry about sterilizing. There's no contamination that's necessary. And you can control these parameters from the very start and really customize your experiment at the lowest cost and at the lowest time burden possible. We have some things planned for the future. Right now, you know, we offer dissolved oxygen and pH, as I spoke about quite a bit. But we also have some other sensing types planned for the very near future. Glucose, glutamine, and CO2 are on the horizon. So here's a bibliography, and we can send this uh, we can send this slide deck out to anyone who may request it afterwards if you want to look closer at the data or check out some of these papers that we talked about. And with that, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Jake. That was an excellent presentation. I, I'd like to start with a few questions. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, we run a lot of these microfluidics and organs on chips conferences. And uh, the question of sensing becomes a big topic. So one of the questions, Jake, is how close does the reader need to be from the sensors to get a good reading? Is there some kind of threshold or could you comment on this? And this question is both for Jake as well as for Dr. Sandy Williams. Great, yeah. So this is what we refer to as standoff distance. And really what this comes down to is the ability of the light from the reader to travel through or across some distance to reach the sensor patch before it fluoresces. And the spec that we have for this is one centimeter. Typically is the distance, the maximum distance. So 
you know, most cell culture vessels are much smaller, you know, a millimeter, maybe a couple of millimeters thick. So we can go up to one centimeter distance when it comes to reading the sensors. Do the sensors work in media alone or can they be placed and there's a media air interface that's also permissible for these sensors to be functional? Right, um, and this is a great question. And uh, like I think I mentioned with the dissolved oxygen sensors, the sensors do not need to be in, immersed in media to function. So you can actually get a reading in dry air, you can get a reading at a liquid gas interface, you can get a, um, a reading completely submerged in liquid. You can really use the dissolved oxygen sensor you know, in any sort of situation. Okay, there's a question from the audience which says, could you comment a little bit more on the use of your sensors in the organ on a chip microphysiological system, how to implement some of these answers you could take offline, but if you could give a kind of a big picture overview as a guidance thoughts, that would be great. Sure. So I'll start it off. And uh, Sandy, if you feel like adding anything afterwards, please chime in. So the idea that we have um, is that just like any other cell culture system out there, microfluidic devices should be monitoring these key parameters like dissolved oxygen and pH, particularly because these, uh, you know, organ on chip devices are being used as replacement for animal models. They're being used for personalized medicine. And when you start getting into the medical field and the medicine world and also drug screening, the FDA really becomes a factor. And what, you know, some of the things they're pushing is standardization across all these processes. So we need to get control of these parameters in these microfluidic devices, just like anything else. So obviously one of the challenges, because these devices are so small, uh, that's something that's really held back the capability of doing sensing in these types of systems. Well, optical sensors are really the smallest types of sensors that we have available. Um, so working together with different designs for organ on a chip, we can integrate these sensors in various ways. I laid out three of the ways earlier in the presentation. One would be in the, in the actual channels and reservoirs in the organ on a chip device, if the geometry allows. And the other one that's a surefire way is in the reservoir. So both the waste reservoir and also the perfusion reservoir or, or you know, the feeding reservoir, we can mount sensors in those um, small reservoirs to get an idea of what's happening with dissolved oxygen and pH before and after that media travels through the organ on a chip device. And then again, in a similar fashion, we can equip the perfusion lines or the feeding lines um, with flow cells that have, that have sensors inside of those tubes. So again, we can get sensing of the media before it travels to the chip and then sensing as the media is traveling out of the chip. Okay, thank you. There's another question for Jake and Sandy from the audience, which is, do you, there's a company in Germany called Presense. You know, I think they are also involved in uh, organons on chips as well as microfluidics, and they are also a company looking at uh, dissolved oxygen. Have you, uh, uh, do you have any comments about the difference between your technology and what Presense does? Yeah, sure. Um, Presense is a great company. Uh, they're a huge company. Um, Sartorius uses them, <clears throat> and really, you know, they've paved the way with optical sensors in a lot of in a lot of ways. Um, but we do have a couple really key differences between our technologies, and the main one is the way that our pH sensors operate. So their pH sensors use a, a little bit of a different formulation, which does cause some issues that we have heard from several users. And unfortunately, it has kind of given optical sensors a bad name or put a bad taste in the mouths of some researchers and collaborators that have tried to use optical sensors, but our pH sensors function in a very different way. Um, so we're, we're trying to right now show people what these sensors are capable of and hope they don't rely on some of the experiences they've had with these other companies um, in the past. So we're really looking for the opportunity to to spread the knowledge about, about optical sensors and to show what they can really do and some of the uses that they have. Right. So there's a follow-up question, which is also from the audience. The oxygen is probably being measured by lifetime measurements. And so it's independent from bleaching during the measurement. Could you, how can you avoid the shift of pH sensors by bleaching? Right, and that's an, that's an amazing question. Um, whoever asked that question really knows what they're talking about <laughs> when it comes to optical sensors, it seems. Um, yeah, like you said, the dissolved oxygen sensors really uh, are not affected by bleaching. And so because these sensors are read optically, they do experience photo bleaching and that is what eventually wears them out. But I will say, I can't reveal too much 
because this is really um, something that we work very hard on. But um, our sensors, our pH sensors, really do not photo bleach. We've worked very hard to develop the technology, and that's one of the things, you know, without saying it explicitly before, that the, the drift rate, as you call it, or as the sensor photo bleaches, is one of the biggest issues that a lot of uh, people have with the pre-sense sensors, but our sensors, we've made sure uh, to really correct that issue. So we don't, we don't experience photo bleaching really to any damaging extent, and our sensors really um, maintain a steady, consistent pH reading because of some of the things that we've developed in the lab. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience, also for uh, Jake and Sandy, is have any leaching effects of the padded adhesive into the cell culture media? ever been observed and you know that changing the composition of the media could you comment please right so the adhesive that we use is silicone based adhesive so it is biofriendly but we are also in the currently in the process of getting our leachables and extractables data so there have been papers published uh, by our collaboration partners that show that our our sensors do not leach into the media and do not change the media composition, but we are getting that formally formally recognized. Currently, we're going through that process right now. So the, the quick answer is that the data shows that there is no leaching from our sensors, and we are getting that proven currently. So we'll have that data available soon. So is it only your company, uh, Jake, as well as Presense, who are involved in providing tools for real-time measurement um, in these devices? microphysiological systems, microfluidic devices, or are there other methodologies if you could kind of give a big picture overview of the field in a nutshell? So kind of give guidance to, to the attendees of this webinar. So when it comes to microfluidics, it's really difficult to do sensing because of the types of sensing that are out there. So obviously the larger probe types are pretty much out the window. There's no way that those are going to work with these systems. Taking offline samples is really not practical either because again, you know, microfluidics means below the middle level. We're working at such low volumes here that you cannot take a sample without really affecting the system. So it seems to me that optical sensing is really the best route to go when working with microfluidic devices. It's the most practical way. The type of sensing that will allow for the least amount of change in your microfluidic system. So th these are, again, minimally invasive, very easy to integrate because they're very small and they can kind of go anywhere you want them to. Again, the reservoir, the, the perfusion lines, even in the actual chip itself, if we design it correctly. So I think optical sensors really, when looking at the big picture of the sensing world, are the best fit for microfluidic devices just because they're so flexible and they have so many customizable ways that they can be applied. Right. Okay. And I, if I could add just a couple of thoughts here. So there are several companies that provide optical sensors. I think the big difference between SBI and some of the other companies, including Presense, is that our focus at SBI is exclusively on regenerative medicine and biotech versus you will find those other sensors in a variety of applications, including food and beverage, environmental, you know, water monitoring. They have kind of a more broader application space where we're really focused on optimizing the technology and the design of the products for regenerative medicine and, and bioprocessing. So that offers a few advantages because all the accessories and all the uh, software is really around these applications. And I wanted to add about ways to incorporate them into microfluidic systems. And there's a lot happening in this field, as, as you all know, being in doing this work, there's even standards development that, that I'm participating in. So there's a lot of exciting things going on. But the way to incorporate the sensors, there's two paths, right? Either you have an existing design and then you're a bit constrained on how you could add the sensors. So the, the paths that Jake mentioned are, are probably the, the best to start with. Or if you're designing a brand new chip, that is prime opportunity to work with a company that provides these sensors and figure out how can you work them into your design. So you really take into consideration a lot of things like you know, the, the flow profile you want to develop. So if you want to put the sensors right inside the channel, your microfluidics device, 
you also have to do some modeling work and figure out the the impact it's going to have on the flow profile and ensuring you still have laminar flow. You can position them near the outlet to minimize that impact. There's a lot of things you, you can do there. So those, if you're designing a system, it's it's a really good time to to work with us to figure out the best way of adding the sensors. Great. Thank you, Dr. Williams. There's another follow-up question from the audience for uh, Jake and Sandy, which is, how will you perform glucose sensing? Are you going to use enzymes such as glucose oxidase, for instance, and measure oxygen consumption? Yeah, I will say um, we can't really say much about our glucose sensor right now because it is still in the hands of our development partners and is still under development. But I will. But what I can say is that it is not an optical sensor. It is a very small sensor, but it uses a, a different method of sensing. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, we still have time for maybe one more question, but whilst you're typing your question, what I'd like to do is ask uh, both Jake and uh, Dr. Williams to give some closing thoughts about the technology, how it fits in the big picture. I think we've addressed it, but this will be kind of some uh, closing bullet points, you know, kind of like a summary, if you will, of the webinar and the offering. So turn it over to both Jake and Sandy. Sure, thank you. So I think I've spoken quite enough, uh, said my piece, so I'm going to hand it over to Sandy. She's always got something really brilliant to say, so Sandy. Thanks, Jake. I don't know about brilliant, but I, I think the main point, you know, we want to communicate is that we want to raise awareness about the existence of these types of sensors. I, I recall when I was designing bioreactor systems about 12 years ago, maybe a little longer, uh, that these products were not available, right? So we were very limited in what we could measure real time. So now the technology is there. Sure, there's always room for optimizing it and making it better and, and more applicable to, to a variety of culture systems. But you now have the opportunity to get data that you couldn't before. So that really lends a lot of insights and a lot of things you can do with your cell culture optimization and, and design of experiments. And we're very fortunate that the group that where this technology originated from uh, at UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore, they have published quite a bit on the sensor technology on a variety of applications. So if any of you are interested in, in getting these publications to go through and, and look how the sensors have been used, have been validated. It is a brand new product in terms of being commercially available, but it has been in the research realm in academia for, for a couple of decades now. So there's a lot of data available about the sensors. Great. There's some follow-up additional questions, There's a lot of interest in this topic. So can the sensor detect dissolved oxygen in a gel layer, such as matrigel, or does it need to be in a fluid? I guess this relates to your regenerative medicine space comment. So both uh, Jake and Dr. Williams can comment, please. Yeah, this is a great question, and this is a question we've gotten in the past. So yeah, the oxygen sensor can function anywhere where it can interact with oxygen. So if it's in a gas layer, for example, it can interact with the oxygen there, and it operates fine. If it is immersed in media, it has access to oxygen that's in the media. And again, if it's in a gel, as long as that gel is in contact with the sensor, the sensor can accurately measure the level of oxygen in that gel. Okay. There's another question. What about uh, sensing microparticles in order to measure in even smaller volumes? This is another question from the audience. Sure. So I'm not sure I understand the question exactly, but so if we're talking about pH and dissolved oxygen, which are the sensors we currently have available, they only interact with, so the oxygen only interacts with oxygen molecules. It's a very specific sensor and the pH is the same. It's only responding to fluctuations in protons. So I'm not sure if that exactly answers the question or if maybe there's a follow-up to that. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to send your questions uh, via email to Select Bio, and we'll forward them to Jake and Dr. Williams. Additionally, if you'd like a copy of the presentation, as Jake mentioned, please reach out to us, and we'd be delighted to forward your uh, query to both uh, Jake and Dr. Williams. So finally, uh, Jake and Dr. Williams will be exhibiting and speaking at the Select Bio Boston meeting in August, as well as in California the microfluidics and organs on chips 
in uh, September. Again, these meetings will be run very safely with appropriate uh, physical distancing. And if you're interested in participating, please uh, reach out to Select Bio. So finally, we'd like to thank Jake and Dr. Sandy Williams for or, uh, supporting this webinar series today. And uh, hope you enjoyed the content. And we look forward to your participation and additional webinars that Select Bio is organizing and hosting. So thank you. And uh, hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.